Father, we pray, we ask you this morning that uh, you would speak to us powerfully through your word. Lord, and I pray that your spirit would lead us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, a few months ago, India and I decided to go to the movies. We don't do that often. Uh, we just can't stay awake for long enough to watch a movie. Um, so we decided to go watch a movie. Uh, we, we went to watch Murder in the Orient Express, all right? So I read Agatha Christie when I was a kid. I was excited. I saw the previews, colorful. I love that kind of movie. So we decided to go. My expectations were high, okay? So we show up. We get great seats, but we realize one thing. The chairs in this movie theater, they reclined a lot to the point that they were vertical. And we started the movie. The movie was kind of slow. And the slower the movie got, the more comfortable those chairs got. You can see where that's going, right? Indy and I fell asleep. And we woke up towards the end of the movie. And we looked at each other and said, you want to leave? And we said, yeah. So we left. So I can't recommend that movie to you, right? Because technically I didn't watch it. So I don't even know what the movie's about. But, but, oh, what a disappointment. Such great expectation, but my expectation wasn't met, right? There, there's a lesson here, right? So high expectations unmet results in disappointment. So unmet expectations produce disappointment. And, and we are about to go into a season flooded with expectations. Some of us expect gifts. Some of us expect to have fun. Some of us during Christmas just expect to rest. Or some of us might just expect to have to survive through the family reunion, right? Uh, uh, we, we, are, we are expecting much. We all can expect much for this season. But eventually... We all will face disappointment. It's, it's bound to happen. Some of us may be forgotten by folks that we cherish and love and care about. Uh, some of us may receive reports that are hard during this season. Some of us might be given a, a tough diagnosis. Disappointment is, a, is an experience. Expectation is to be expected in a fallen world where there's sin and brokenness. On the other end of the spectrum, there is biblical hope. And this is what I want you to understand today. Christmas is about hope. What is biblical hope? Well, I'm defining biblical hope. I think this will be helpful for us today. I'm defining biblical hope this way. Biblical hope is the deep assurance that God will be faithful to his future promises. And this assurance affects the way we walk today. So, so as we consider Isaiah 11, my prayer for you is that your faith may be built up and that your faith will help you walk in godliness. Before we break down the text, let me give you a little brief background in the book of the, of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet that lived about 700 years before Christ. During his time, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been banished from the promised land because of their disobedience. Now it's time for the southern kingdom to be banished as well. And for what reason? The same reason. Disobedience. For the same reason, breaking the covenant of God. During his ministry, Isaiah was tasked with the mission of delivering this hard and difficult news to the people of the southern kingdom. 
Isaiah's message is not repent from your sin or you will be punished. Isaiah's message is you will be punished for your sin. But trust the Lord. Trust in his promises. Trust amidst punishment. And that is the message that we need today as well, isn't it? Trust the Lord. Trust his promises amidst hardship. One feature that we're going to see in this text today, okay, is, is the overlapping of short-term fulfillment and long-term fulfillment of prophecies. So we're talking about prophetic literature. A lot of prophetic literature is the, is the foretelling of future events. But some of these prophecies would be fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. And some of them will be fulfilled in Jesus' second coming. The message of Christmas is a message of hope for today and for tomorrow. So when we look at these at this prophecies, it's kind of like looking at a chain of mountains. Have you ever, have ever driven into Tennessee? Right? Tennessee is beautiful, right? Have you ever driven into Tennessee and saw right, from afar the Smoky Mountains? They all look like one big mountain, right? But as you, as you drive through them, there are highs and lows. Highs and lows. That's how prophecy often takes place in, in the Bible. But here's what's encouraging about this, right? Jesus has fulfilled so many of the prophecies that even we're going to look at today that we can truly hope that he will eventually fulfill them all. That is the basis of Christian faith. God has been faithful yesterday, so he will be faithful tomorrow. So we walk by faith and not by sight. My goal, my goal with this message today is to help you overcome disappointments in your life by placing your hope or your expectations on the promises of God rather than, rather than on the promises of men. So as we, work through, as we work through this text today, I want to point out three promises that we're going to see in this, in this text that we're called to hope on. First, we're going to see, and I'm going to give this to you again as we work through the text, okay? We're going to see in verses 1 through 5, uh, hope in a righteous ruler. We're called to hope in a righteous ruler. Verses 6 through 9 is going to show us that we are to hope in a renewed earth. And verses 10 through 16 these verses are going to show us that we can hope in restore relationships. I'm not going to read the whole text in the beginning just for the sake of time. But as we work through, the, through, this, through this message, I will read through the, through the whole text. Okay? So let's consider that first point. Hope in a righteous ruler. Verses 1 through 5. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of, of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see. Or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So God's first promise is that he would send a ruler to rule over the world. And what would this ruler be like? Well, first we see that this ruler would be humble. You see that in verse 1? It says that this ruler won't be, won't be 
a huge tree, right? This willow will be a shoot from a stump, from a dead tree. In Isaiah 5, God compares Israel to a vineyard that produced sour grapes. And God tells Israel, I am going to chop you down, Israel. And you are going to be nothing but a stump. No life. But out of no life comes life, comes hope. Here he says that this is the stump of Jesse, Israel. Who is Jesse anyway? Well, Jesse is the father of King, J King, David, King, King David. But then why not just say, there shall come a shoot from the stump of David? Well, because Isaiah is emphasizing the ruler's unassuming beginning. When we read this text, we ask, who is Jesse? Who is this stump coming from anyway? Well, this stump is coming from the father of David. He would not be a great ruler because he came from a powerful family. He would be a great ruler because he was filled with the Spirit. That's our second point. This ruler would be Spirit-filled. Look at verse 2. He is filled with the Spirit of the Lord. He is filled with the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. Seven here indicates perfection. This ruler would be perfectly filled with the Lord. And there's much that can be said here about how these words are coupled together and brought together. But, but we don't have time for that. So what does that mean? Bringing all these seven words together, what does that mean? I think this simply means that he would be a ruler who was <laughs> willing and able to rule. He is mighty and wise. Third, this ruler would be godly. Look at the first line of verse 3. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Have you ever met someone who just does the bare minimum just to get by? Have you ever been served by someone like that? It's pretty annoying, right? You know, here at Sheridan Hills, I have experienced the opposite of that. Sheridan Hills, you have been nothing but generous people towards us, and we are thankful for that. Just the other day, we were given a crib, great crib, by Ivan and Danette. And Ivan came over to help me assemble the crib. Uh, I'm not very handy, so all I did was hand Ivan the tools. Uh, I did that really well, I hope. Um, and, and at the end, when they, when they were leaving, Ivan said, thank you. And I said, thank me? No, thank you. Thank you for serving me, right? <coughs> the, the delight was so clear and evident that he was thankful for serving. You see, this, this is like this ruler, isn't it? This ruler delights in the fear of the Lord. He's not like the people who just try to get by. He delights in the fear of the Lord. Lord, he loves to do the will of the Father. This ruler is not like Israel, right? I Isaiah is contrasting here the ruler in Israel. Listen to what Jeremiah said a couple of generations later in Jeremiah 5. But this people has a stubborn and rebellious heart. They have turned aside and gone away. They do not say in their hearts, let us fear the Lord our God. But now listen what John in John 8 says about Jesus. What Jesus is saying about himself. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is Jesus delights in doing the will of the Father. Do you seek to do your own will? Or do you seek to do the will of the Father? Do, do you ask the Lord, Lord, 
what will you have me do in this situation constantly? As a matter of fact, when was the last time we prayed that prayer? Lord, would you tell me what to do so I can do your will? You see, in, in church life, in Christian life, we have this mystical idea of what the will of the Father is. We have this, uh, am I in the will of God or am I not on it? It's just so murky. Do you want to know what the will of the Father is? Ask Him. Ask Him and He will make it known to you. But then this, this ruler would also be just. He does not judge according to his senses, what he sees or what he hears. But instead, he judges with righteousness, equity. He defends the, the weak and punishes the wicked. What an incredible resume, isn't it? Can you imagine that resume? What do you do? I, I, I defend the weak and I, and I punish the wicked. That's a great resume. Oh, tell me about yourself. Well, I am perfectly humble. I am perfectly spirit-filled, I am perfectly godly, and I am perfectly just. How's that for a resume? His kingdom is here among us right now. He is ruling over our hearts as we hear His word and heed it. And yet, we still hope for a day when His rule will be over every heart. But, but remember that at the beginning I said that biblical hope, right, uh, trusting the promises of God, does not just affect how we will walk in the future, but it ought to also affect how we walk today, right? So what are some ways that we can be, that we can be heeding, that we can be obeying the word of God as we trust in his promise? First, let me say this. Jesus is the righteous ruler of the entire universe. Period. That's not up for debate. We're not discussing here whether or not Jesus rules over the whole universe. He does. So, so friend, that is, that is a message of trouble. Right? Because we all have <laughs> sinned. Meaning we all have in different ways rebelled against God. And the righteous ruler of the universe will bring a righteous charge against us all. So no one can stand indifferent before Jesus. Thinking that you're okay just because you're ignoring Jesus. It's kind of like trying to hide from a grizzly bear by putting a maple leaf on your head. It doesn't work. The bear will find you. Likewise, thinking that you are okay with Jesus because you're ignoring him won't work. The judge will find you. <coughs> Likewise, friends, do not view Jesus as an option. You will have to take a stand before this judge. But there's a shocker here. You know what the shocker is? Jesus, the judge, was judged. That's shocking. Because this is the Jesus that's perfectly humble, right? And he was judged. Perfectly, spotless, Sinless. The judge was judged for his own sins? No, for ours. For the sins of all who believe in him and all who have received him. So at the end of the day, the question that matters is, do you believe that Jesus died and paid for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again and now rules the world. But what about if you're already trusting in Christ and you stand forgiven, right? We're still called to live a certain way. We're still called to live a certain way 
considering the fact that Jesus rules. So here, here's my first advice for you. First of, first of January is coming up, right? So how many of you have ever done New Year's resolutions? Ever? Okay, I think some of you guys are not telling the truth. I think all of us, at least in our minds, have, right? I am going to give you your New Year's re resolution for 2019. Okay, ready? Here is your New Year's resolution. Number one. Number one, trust in Jesus Christ. Write it down. This is your New Year's resolution. Number two, be like Christ. Number three, no, just kidding. There's no number three. Okay, we stop there. Trust in Christ and believe in Christ. That's what you're called to do. There's nothing beyond that. That will affect the way you walk. Trust in Jesus. Do not put your hope in cars or in horses, but trust Jesus rules the earth with truth and grace. Don't put your ultimate trust in politics or the democratic process. There's only one supreme court, and it's right now sitting in heaven. And it only has one judge, Jesus Christ. Trust him. Be like Jesus. Look at this list. Humble, spirit-filled, godly, just. Do these characteristics describe you, Christian? Can you say that you're growing in the likeness of Christ? Parents, can you say to your children? Husbands, can you say to your wives? Wives, can you say to your husbands? Friends, can you say to your friends? Be imitators of me as I am an imitator of Christ. Can people follow you and not stray? from Christ. Friends, by faith, by faith we grow from glory to glory. But now let's look at number two. Hope in a renewed earth. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf, and the lion, and the fattened calf together. And the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze together, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the wind child shall put his hand on the otter's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we started with a new ruler, right? Now we see a new earth, right? The ruler is so powerful that his ruling changes nature. Have you ever seen those animal shows on TV? You know, the ones that, that, that there's a gazelle, right? Just jumping. And then there's a lion, right? And the lion starts chasing the gazelle. And everybody's hoping that the gazelle will get away. And when the gazelle finally gets away, then somebody, usually with a British accent, says, and the lion hasn't eaten in over 30 days. And the lion will likely die of starvation. And we're saying, no! Now there's a lion in Africa dying, and it's my fault, right? Have you ever seen those shows? Th th this world is not like that, though, right? This world is, is free of violence. This world is a world of peace, even in the animal world. Even the irrational animals in this world, prey and predator, lie down together. This is, this is a world where children are not at risk. Children don't die here. Instead, they lead lions and leopards and play with cobras. This is a world that is not broken. 
This section here is not talking merely about the end of sin, although that is part of it. A leopard is not sinning when he kills a goat, or, or a lion is not sinning when he kills a calf. But this is world, this is a world that is our world today, filled with violence. But you won't be so in the world to come. These verses are talking about the end of brokenness. Sinfulness is faithless rebellion against God. Brokenness is the consequence of this rebellion. We are both, we are both active in the brokenness of this world in, in our sins... And we are victims in our brokenness. We both sin against and we are sinned against. Brokenness is why hurricanes exist. Brokenness is why viruses exist. Brokenness is why cancer, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, heart attacks, ulcers, and broken bones exist. Brokenness is the reason why we feel sometimes that our bodies are fighting against us. Do you feel broken? Is your body aching right now? Do you feel the brokenness in your own body? Friends, so does creation. Creation feels it as well. Look at Romans 8. For the creation was subject to the futility, in other words, to brokenness. Not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Brokenness is supposed to produce hope. You see that? In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. In other words... Creation, the world is saying, no more. Let's end with this. No more bondage to the consequences of sin. You know what creation is saying? Creation is saying, come, Lord Jesus. Come again. Complete the work you begun 2,000 years ago. Come and rule over us once for all. But when will this happen? Well, the text tells us. Look at verse 9. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When, when the world is full of the knowledge of the Lord, right? When the gospel message saturates the earth, we will live in a perfect world. And if you are trusting in Christ, you are, going to, you are going to live under his benevolent rule. So, so how should this hope right, renew in a renewed earth renew us today as we look forward to this promise? First, how will the earth be filled with the knowledge of God if Preachers don't go preach to places where the gospel is not. Friends, do you understand the great privilege we have as Southern Baptists to give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering? It's a privilege. It's not a burden. It's not a burden. We are privileged to be a part of God's plan to reach the unreached with the gospel. Have you given sacrificially? Will you? W will you say with this message, Come, Lord Jesus, rule over all the earth, both with your prayers and with your paychecks? Will you trust the Lord in this way? Second, do you feel the brokenness in your body right now? Do you feel the pain right now? Are you dealing with a serious diagnosis? Are, are you dealing 
with depression? Are, are you dealing with a broken body in a broken world? Listen to these verses, Isaiah 40. But they who wait for the Lord, those who trust in the Lord, hope in the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and shall not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Do, do you realize that as high as LeBron James can jump, he can't fly, right? As fast as Usain Bolt can run, he tires. Right? Have you ever seen him run the 200 meter dash? He tires towards the end, right? Not you. Not you in the world to come. You're not just going to be okay, you're going to be awesome. You're going to be able to, you're going to be able to jump higher than LeBron James. And you're going to be able to run faster than Usain Bolt. You're going to be able to swim better than Michael Phelps. Friends, we are going to be awesome in the world to come. So take hope because your body was built for eternity. And along with earth, it too will be renewed. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, verse 17. So we do not lose heart, <coughs> though our outer self, our body, right, <coughs> is wasting away our inner self, our spirit is being renewed day by day. For this, listen to what Paul thinks of your suffering. Okay? It's not me, it's Paul. For this light and momentary. Your suffering in light, in light of eternity is light and momentary. Do you believe that? For this light and momentary affliction is preparing, it's doing something, right? It's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This text is saying that our suffering prepares us more glory in the world to come. So what we do? We walk in suffering with hope. We do not lose heart. So take heart, weary saints. Because your suffering is not in vain. It's building for you a future glory. And it will not last forever. It will come to an end. Finally, number three. Let us consider hope in restored relationships. Look at verse 10. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall nations inquire. And his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and those who harass Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall swoop down on the shoulder of the Philistines in the west, and together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall put out their hand against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites shall obey them. And the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the sea of Egypt, and will have his hand over the river. With his scorching breath and strike it into seven channels. And he will lead people across in sandals. And there will be a highway from Assyria. For the remnant that remains of his people. As that was for Israel. When they came up from the land of Egypt. D did you catch a subtle change? Yet very important here. In verse 1. We heard that this promised ruler was the uh, was the root was the shoot of Jesse right but what does it say in verse 10 
In verse 10, it says that he is the root of Jesse. What, what is this change? I mean, every word from God is inspired, right? So, so God must have a purpose for this. This change is saying that we ought not to confuse humility with powerlessness. The suffering servant is the ruling king. Jesus is the son of David, but he is also David's Lord. Do not mistake Jesus' humility for powerlessness. He is powerful. <coughs> People from all the walks of life will be attracted to Christ. Look at verses 10 in the first part of verse 12. Gentiles will look to Christ. Right? Isn't that what I'm saying? And we'll inquire about him. And then in verses 11, in the second half of verse 12, we said, we we're told here that the faithful remnants of Israel will also come to this ruler. It's kind of like a second exodus, right? The people who have been banished are coming back. By the way, I don't think this is talking about a mass return to Jerusalem. A mass return to this small plot of land in Palestine. This place is greater than that. This place is perfect. This place is idyllic. This place is kind of like paradise. You see, this is talking about a return to paradise. This is the new Eden. This is what the Bible calls the Jerusalem from above. The new earth. After all, in this place, right? It says that the whole earth, not just a small plot of land, the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord. The whole earth will be paradise. Will be full of the glory of God like the waters cover the sea. How do the waters cover the sea? Completely, right? The whole earth is going to be God's promised land for us. This place is so perfect and this ruler is so powerful that even the relationships in this land, in this place, are restored. <coughs> and how does God restore these relationships? Well, the first thing that we see in verse 13 is that he removes the hostility among the peoples. There's no hostility among those who are of him, those who belong to him. You see, verse 13, it talks about Ephraim being jealous of Judah, right? But not for long. Ephraim here is, is standing as, as, the, as, as one group that, that symbolizes the whole northern kingdom of Israel. So they had gone off into exile in 722 BC, right? They had gone into Assyria. Now Ephraim was teaming up with Assyria to harass the southern kingdom. The very people of God was teaming up with those who were not God's people to harass God's people. That's a broken family. Those are broken relationships. Right? A captor teaming up with its slaves to harass its own people. But that will change. That's what these verses tell us. God's people will once again live in perfect peace with each other. And it begins here. Renewed relationships. Isn't that right? Look at ourselves. We're different people from different walks of life. And we love each other. Perfectly? No. But in a way that we can demonstrate that God has changed our hearts? Yes. This is starting. This promise is being fulfilled right now through the church. In the church, in Christ, right? 
Gentiles and Jews can come together and worship the one, through God, the one true God. We're being united again. Friends, God can change even the hardest of hearts. Do you need to be reconciled to someone, to a brother or a sister today? Is there someone in this room that you need to be reconciled with? Are you offended or have you offended someone here? Will you seek them out today at the end of the service? Go up to them and seek to forgive and be forgiven. Children, are you at odds with your parents? Do you harbor bitterness in your heart towards them? Will you seek them out and seek to reconcile your relationship with them? Will you speak to them? Speak to them at lunch today. Will you speak to them and ask for forgiveness and ask to be reconciled with them? Husbands, are you at odds with your wife? Does the person perhaps even sitting next to you right now, does, does that person feel like an enemy? Does it feel like you're sitting next to an enemy? Wives, are you at odds with your husband? You need reconciliation. You need to have faith in the righteous ruler. You see, reconciliation begins with faith. You need the ruler's rule to rule in your heart. But what is this rule that needs to take place in your heart? See, in, in your outline today, I put some verses that I think would help you think about what reconciliation ought to look like. Verses about loving one another. Verses about not judging one another. Verses about carrying one another's burdens. Verses about considering each other's needs as more important than our own. Why don't you take time this afternoon or this evening and read these verses with your spouse? Go read them. And pray that the Lord will teach you the wisdom of His Word and will reconcile you to your spouse. So that you may not any longer fight with one another, but serve one another. So that you may no longer live for yourself, but so that you may live for the other. So this ruler removes the hostility among his people. But this ruler also destroys the opposition of his enemy. We see that in verses 14 through 15. Friends, all who oppose Christ will find themselves facing terrible judgment. God, in His justice, will punish all who reject His Son. But God's last word for His people is always a word of hope. Right there, look at verse 16. And there will be a highway from Assyria for the remnants that remains of his people. And there, as there was for Israel when they, come up from, they came up from the land of Egypt. This is Exodus language, right? So, so the prophet here is taking Israel back to the time of Exodus and saying, Did God not make a way for you to come out of captivity and come into my promises. He's saying God will do it again. And what is this highway that takes us out of bondage, bondage to sin and brokenness into the promises of God? The highway is Jesus Himself. It is when we're found united with Christ, when His rule rules our hearts. That we walk on the highway to God's promises. Church, take heart. You are on this highway. 
If you're trusting in Christ and you're repenting from your sin, God is with you and He will walk with you to the end. So let us fight for faith with that hope. Let us fight for righteousness with a hope. Friend, there's still access to the highway today if you are not one with Christ. You may stand today as an enemy of God. But if you join this highway, that will be no longer the case. And we'll be walking into the promises of God. So, Christmas doesn't have to be disappointing. Because the sufferings of this world will be merely light and momentary. The disappointments of broken families, of, un, of unmet expectations, will be light and momentary in comparison to the eternal glory of being with God. You were made for eternity. So hope in eternity for God's eternal promises never disappoints. Let's pray together.